Hello everyone, once again time for another um, video in which we read an article and discuss it. And uh, before we start, I'd like to um, extend my thanks to one of, uh, one of our viewers who has posted a comment on almost every recent video. Uh, thank you Elise for doing that. We've seen your comments, we'll come back to you with um, replies and uh, if you want to uh, have a chat with us, uh, we are open to do that either privately or <laughs> in a video. So just reach out to us and perhaps we can have like a half an hour chat and discuss some of the things that uh, would be interesting for you as well. Um, so what we have today is an article by Rebecca Wurfsbrock and, Elis and um, Matthias Ferraes, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, about uh, a part of domain-driven design, uh, domain modeling. Now before we move on, what I like to do is to make a few introductions for these people, okay? We've had uh, Rebecca on this channel before. I'm a big fan of hers. Uh, she's one of those people who, if you spend some time with her, you feel that your IQ is increasing. Uh, you feel that you learn a lot about uh, software design, about architecture, about modeling, about these things. Uh, it's, it's very impressive uh, what you can learn from her. Uh, I don't know Matthias, uh, I'm following him on Twitter. Do you know anything about Matthias other than, you know, what's public? Or I think we, we crossed at a few conferences, I think in Paris and some somewhere in Belgium or in Netherlands. Uh, didn't have time to chat to properly, but um, as far as I know, he's very uh, interested and has a passion on this uh, on domain driven design and he's uh, also part of organizing if i'm not mistaken uh, ddd europe so domain driven design europe conference uh, and uh, uh, he's basically uh, someone very passionate who's part of this whole domain driven design community um, and you you can hear him in many talks around these topics and you can I read many articles and many tweets and many many stuff around him. So he's very knowledgeable uh, on this area, I think. Yeah, he also has a blog, uh, Matthias Ferraes, uh, and I see a lot of interesting titles here, only I never had time to, to actually look at it. Uh, now, a bit of a spoiler. I hope, I think we will have him on this channel in a few weeks. So we'll be able to have a longer conversation with him on topics like this. It's, and it's really cool. I can't wait to, for this to happen, but it's just, well, a matter of scheduling. Uh, it, it can be difficult sometimes. Um, and also before we move on, what do we think about domain driven design? Uh, <laughs> oh. So I, I have like friends who are very into this uh, topic. I think it's something very useful if you work in a complex environment and very badly applied. <laughs> so that's my view on domain driven design. What I've seen um a bit from outside. I've never been to one of these conferences on domain driven design um, or I've checked, of course, I've had some chats with people who are very much into domain driven design. Um, and we've often heard the programmers uh, from local communities or from companies saying that, you know, this solves everything. <laughs> domain driven design will solve a lot of our problems. And I'm not sure that's true, uh, yeah. but I've applied a few things. So, so I think domain modeling is very powerful once you understand how to do it correctly. 
um, the challenge here is that you end up with those boundary um, models or boundary context. what do you call them concept yeah a bounded context, context but context. outside the bounded context you have concepts mm -hmm. that have different meanings uh, mm -hmm. In the boundary bond. context, yeah. Yeah. boundary model um, concepts, I think they're called. Yeah, yeah, and this is. Uh, I saw this was a challenge for many people trying to apply domain-driven design. It's not mm -hmm. very clear how to do that, which is natural because you are dealing with complex domains. But it's one of mm -hmm. the challenges. And then another thing that I've seen, it led to a number of different um, architectural styles, hexagonal architecture, ports and adapters, um, event... Uh, Event-driven design. Uh, well, event-driven event design. Storming. Event storming, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and event, uh, event storming. And I think there was also something around, um, you know, storing events instead of storing mm -hmm. exactly yeah yeah um instead of storing data mm -hmm. wh which is a good idea until you get gdpr and then <laughs> and you need to delete things from the past um and yeah. i think there were a few others right i mean microservices is a bit inspired by domain driven design um mm -hmm. I think they were in parallel in a way. They they merged. <laughs> yeah. One thing I noticed though is that a lot of the interesting design conversations have moved from uh, conferences on object-oriented design into the domain-driven design conferences. So I think it's a space that's very interesting to watch, particularly for the uh, conversations related to uh, software design in general yeah but uh i think it's kind of natural because uh but I, I don't know i think rebecca was talking about this that uh, eric evans or i don't remember who was on the, our channel who was talking about this that eric evans when he started uh, thinking about these uh, ideas he was basically part of the plop community and he uh he uh, was part of many refining sessions and uh, many part of many of those workshops where they were writing um, uh, patterns, patterns, mm. patterns. So I think uh, it, it's, it makes sense because that's an, uh, a community that started from the object-oriented uh, <laughs> way, right? Uh, and then um, they focus a lot on patterns and Eric Evans was there and now everything that, uh, well, what he sparked, the, this whole domain-driven design ideas, now go back to those ideas and even more. I mean, they are basically, they add up on new stuff that appeared because of the new environment and the new challenges. Uh, so that's a base, there's a basis, there are new things on top. So I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's one thing that I forgot about, but it's worth mentioning that um, actually the initial idea of the domain-driven design is about domain modeling plus patterns. And those patterns were written most likely within the PLOP communities, uh, patterns language of programming <laughs> communities, if you don't know what it's about. And... Um, uh, that's how we get things like aggregates and uh, whatever else is there. Uh, I don't yeah, remember. Uh, they come from the old object uh, people, let's say. Mm -hmm. The people who started object-oriented programming languages back in the 80s. So that's the root of everything. Okay. And one more thing that I need to add about domain-driven design, uh, there's a potential drawback. To in, There's a possibility of turning a domain-driven design activity into big design upfront. Uh, this is one of the challenges, I think, of this approach. 
and one that at least in the conversations that I had with people who love domain driven design is not very carefully dealt with. They yes. tend to kind of ignore it and say, yeah, we'll, we'll keep doing that. <laughs> so that, that's why my first comment about it was that it's, it's not well applied. I think in almost all the workshops where I treated parts of domain driven design, I never thought really domain driven design, but if I had like workshops with architects where we needed to look at bounded contacts and understand how we model a more complex environment, they were kind of blocked in, in many of these ideas. And it's difficult to understand the zoom in, zoom out that you need to do. That's not a criticism of domain driven design. That's a skill that you need to have in order to apply domain driven design. Uh, I think domain driven design is a very good tool, but you need to have the skills to apply it. And unfortunately, I see it applied without having all those skills to understand the, the needs, the many needs that you need to understand as an architect or designer from business, from the, the domain that, that can be very complex, the systems that you have, communication models, uh, maybe business changes, the way the business shifts or where you're going strategically with the business. So all of these things are difficult to get. Mm -hmm. And I, I can say that uh, we've applied uh, domain modeling and it's a really powerful tool. Uh, I like it, but uh, yeah, you need to be careful. So with this being said, I think we can agree it's a useful tool, but uh, mm -hmm. you need to apply it carefully. It, it may seem more simple than it actually is. <laughs> oh, yes. All right. So let's go into this article this is called um, designer reality and has a subtitle reframing the problem through design this is already very interesting because many people assume that um, when you you are doing software design you take the problem and the problem is immovable and then you turn it into a design oh, okay? yeah. and the design so hopefully is immovable <laughs> That's so school-like approach. You think that you have a problem, you're in school and you need to have the solution and there you go. Yeah. When in reality, what happens is that through the act of designing, you learn more about the problem. Mm -hmm. And that's the most interesting part of design, because if it were something sequential, then we wouldn't need a lot of skills to do design. Okay, oh, yeah. and, and then it starts, um, there is a fallacy about how domain modeling works. The misconception is that we can design software by discovering all the relevant concepts in the domain, turn them into concepts in our design, add some behaviors, and voila, we've solved our problem. It's a simplistic perception of how design works, a linear path from A to B. Understand the problem, apply design, end up with a solution. Absolutely agree, yeah. This is a fallacy. And um, you actually have cycles here. And I guess this is what they will talk about. Uh, the idea was so central in early object-oriented design that one of us, Rebecca, thought to refute it in her book. And this is a quote that is very, very interesting. By the way, this book, Object uh, Design, really worth getting. I think there was a promotion, uh, it, and I'm not sure if this book, but one of Rebecca's books is available for free, uh, which is a ripoff. <laughs> you should probably pay for it <laughs> because they are so good. Um, early object design books, including my own designing object-oriented software, speaks, uh, speak of finding objects by identifying things, noun phrases, written in a design specification. So this is an approach that we've all learned, I think. Um, read the requirements document, find the nouns, those are your objects. Mm -hmm. Right? 
In hindsight, this approach seems naive. Today, we don't advocate underlining nouns and simplistically modeling things in the real world. It's much more complicated than that. Finding good objects means identifying abstractions that are part of your application's domain and its execution machinery. Their correspondence to real-world things may be tenuous at best. Even when modeling domain concepts, you need to look carefully at how these objects fit into your overall application design. So already, very good lesson. Um, you still see in some object-oriented books uh, the idea that you find con that in object-oriented you model the real world, right? Mm -hmm. And this is not true at all. We model something that fits our software, our designs. Mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, because that's modeling. That's why you say model. Uh, it's not a replica of the real world, it's a modeling. So you model it to fit your context. Yeah. And uh, so this is an old idea that has been long time away refuted. <laughs> but it's still uh, persistent. And yeah, look. I haven't even read this, but this is what, <laughs> what she tells, what they tell next. The idea has persisted in many naive interpretations of domain-driven design as well. Domain language and ubiquitous language are often conflated. They're not mm -hmm. the same. Okay, so let's stop a bit and explain this. What is domain language and what is ubiquitous language? Yeah, so domain language is, I, I call it jargon, okay? But uh, 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 I think there it's just the terms, the concepts that people use. If you go, I don't know, into a, if you work as a consultant in a bank, they will start telling you about stuff like how the payment works and what are the steps in the payment flow and how I don't know how you give you have a credit, you reimburse it, how. What's a payment? What's a down payment? What's a uh, interest? Uh, types interest. Of interest. So all these things are domain language, and then of course you can go into very much details about interest and how they are and so on, or documents that justify your income. Again, income is a is a concept, and so on. So they are uh, words that uh, really represents something that was created in a very long time with a very clear meaning. Because if we talk like uh, about banking, it's probably this concept started existing somewhere in, I don't know, 1600s or something like that <laughs> in uh, Venice. Uh, and then they, they started being more and more refined and other concepts appeared. So these are the domain language these these uh, concepts constitute the domain language it's the same if you go somewhere else i don't know in sports okay in sports you'll hear any all these words that have their their meaning in in their in their jargon uh, so every or in engineering right mm -hmm. if you go into construction uh, you'll hear some words that have some meaning uh, like uh, I don't know the resistance uh, to an earthquake or how you compute that or uh, you will hear about now because it's of course everyone cares about uh, insulating their homes uh, you'll hear all, all kinds of concepts around um, resistance to heat or to cold and so on so everything like that is domain language but then if ubiquitous language we say that it's a uh, a simplified language, a formalized language that you you use uh, and of course it starts from the domain language but you use this ubiquitous language to define your concepts when you model them. So in a way as you as you said previously that you model the reality, you don't make a replica of it. in a way I think it's the same like ubiquitous language, 
it's a modeling of the domain language. Yeah, and actually the next paragraphs explain this. Uh, I, I'm always amazed by how well Rebecca writes, and uh, <laughs> and in this case, it's precisely what you expect. Uh, really good. Domain language is what is used by people working in the domain. Uh, it's a natural language and therefore messy. It's organic. Concepts are introduced out of necessity, without deliberation, without agreement, without precision. Mm -hmm. Terminology spreads across the organization or fades out, meaning shifts. People adapt old terms into new meanings or terms acquire multiple ambiguous meanings. It exists because it works at least well enough for human-to-human -human communication. A domain language, like all language, only works in the specific context it evolved in. This is important to understand because if you are talking about things like account, it's one thing about talking about an account within a context of a bank. It's another thing about talking, uh, I don't know, in the context of an insurance company. It's another thing in the context of a internet provider or you know mm -hmm. same or different meanings but they all work within that specific context for us system designers messy language is not good enough we need precise language with well understood concepts and explicit context this is what a ubiquitous language is a constructed formalized language agreed upon by stakeholders and designers to serve the needs of our design we need more control over this language than we have over the domain language. The ubiquitous language has to be deeply connected to the domain language or there will be discord. The level of formality and precision in any ubiquitous language depends on its environment. A meme sharing app and an oil rig control system have different needs. <laughs> I love this example. It's so cool. Um, yeah, so that's exactly what you say. It, uh, I think uh, th this is one of the problems going back to domain-driven design applied in real life, let's say. He, first of all, you need to understand language very well. You need to be a very good speaker. That's my view. For, that's my or writer. understanding. Yeah. Speaker, writer, you need to have a very good vocabulary in the language that you use for your ubiquitous language. That's a I don't know, a humanistic skill that you need to have in order to have a good modeling of this ubiquitous language. You need to understand how uh, vocabulary forms and how words connect and be very precise about their meaning. Um, that's why quite often when I do this exercise, I go back to the dictionary. Yeah. I spend uh, hours on, on thesaurus or dictionary or a uh, list of synonyms figuring out because there are many words, but some words are more specific than others. Some words are more, um, how would you say, uh, they have different nuances. Broad. They're too broad. They have many yeah. meanings. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons when, and we see this actually in code, right? Because yes. an easy way of figuring out whether you can, um, whether you have good vocabulary skills, let's say, <laughs> to do domain-driven design, is to find the best words for variables in your code. Mm -hmm. Just think about variables. Okay, let's forget for now about methods and classes and so on. But if you only take your variables, um, if you have variables called A and B and C, you know, those are completely meaningless. Uh, they don't tell anything. But if you also if you have things like item or those have some meaning, but it's so broad it can mean almost anything. So then it's about, you know, finding the, the essence of uh, the specific entity in your code that you're trying to figure out. It's the same thing that you're trying to do with domain-driven design, but at a much higher level. And 
with a lot with more a bigger consequences. Impact. Yeah. yeah. With a bigger impact because a word that's not well understood or it's not well formed in that ubiquitous language dictionary, okay, it's uh, going. It, it can generate many confusion. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and the article goes into an, uh, I think, a story, an example. Drilling mud. Talking about oil rigs, Rebecca was invited to consult for a company that makes hardware and software for oil rigs. Okay, that's an interesting job. She was asked to help with object design and modeling, working on redesigning the control system that monitors and manages sensors and equipment on the oil rig. Drilling causes a lot of friction and drilling mud, a proprietary chemical substance, is used as a lubricant. It's also used as a carrier for the rocks and debris you get from drilling, lifting it all up and out of the hole. Equipment monitors the drilling mud pressure and by changing the composition of the mud during drilling, you can control that pressure. Too much pressure is a really bad thing. Um, yeah, you can almost imagine how these things work. So you have a drill that goes into the, the earth, basically. It turns and uh, due to the rotation, you also need uh, this kind of lubricant, right? Because otherwise it will just get stuck and the engines don't work anymore. Try to push it and it doesn't work. And, and then an oil rig in the Gulf exploded. <laughs> As the news stories were coming out, the team found out that the rig was using a competitor's equipment. Who? The team started speculating about what could have happened and were thinking about how something like that could happen with their own systems. Was it faulty equipment, sensors, the telemetry, communication between various components, the software? Interesting scenario. Uh, when in Dao look for examples, the team ran through scenarios. What happens when a catastrophic condition occurs? How do people react? When something fails, it's a noisy environment for the old rig engineers. Sirens blaring, alarms going off. We discovered that when a problem couldn't be fixed immediately, the engineers, in order to concentrate, would turn off the alarms after a while. So uh, just to stop here for a moment, because we often forget that people use systems. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we assume that if we give a lot of alerts, that people will actually read those alerts. Uh, careful with that. <laughs> you need to pay attention to the whole system. Mm -hmm. When a failure is easy to fix, the control system's logs reflect that the alarm went on and was turned off a few minutes later. But for more consequential failures, even though these problems take much longer to resolve, it still shows up on the logs as being resolved within minutes. <laughs> because, of course, you record when the alarm was turned off, not when mm -hmm. the actual problem was solved. Then when people study the logs, it looks like the failure was resolved quickly, but it's totally inaccurate. This may look like a software bug, but it's really a flaw in the model. And we should use it as an opportunity to improve that model. So I haven't read um, the article, uh, but I assume that what's coming is a new domain entity. <laughs> The initial modeling assumption is that alarms are directly connected to the emergency conditions in the world. However, the system's perception of the world is distorted. When the engineers turn off the alarm, the system believes the emergency is over. But it's not. Turning an alarm off doesn't change the emergency condition in the world. The mm -hmm. alarms are only indirectly connected to the emergency. If it's indirectly connected, there's something else in between that doesn't exist in our model. The model is an incomplete representation of the effect of the world, and that could be catastrophic. This is a very, very interesting example because it shows how you can miss a domain entity from your model, and that can have real world 
repercussions, presumably costing millions of dollars. Right. Yeah, I, I remember that this is very well connected with uh, effective evolutionary design, test-driven development, <laughs> in, a, in the same way, because when you start modeling through by putting pressure with tests on your design, you find out something a bit the same. You find out that you're missing a concept. Here, if you have, I think, the same idea of figuring out scenarios, scenarios of how people would behave in, in relationship to your system, you could figure out that you're missing a concept. Mm -hmm. So basically the two, the two ideas I think are similar. If you have a model, a, a, a domain that you modeled either through TDD or through domain driven design or any other way, you need to put pressure on it to see where it fails because yeah. quite often you need you will see that something is missing from your domain in this way and i think this is one of the challenges of software developer software development because we tend to stop when um when software starts working mm -hmm. yeah and then you're very reactive when it doesn't work yeah but this is the same like, like trying to have i don't know a, a very good example of trying to put pressure on your, your system is something like um user user um, tests so where, where you see how the user interacts with your system and you could find out that they interact in a very uh, different way than you what you'd expect so yeah, usability tests, something like that. Uh, but there are many ways of, of trying to do that. Um, so I guess a kind of stress testing your model, your design, your architecture is always needed before going further. It's a kind of feedback loop. Yeah. Actually, this reminds me, it's a bit tangential, so I won't go a lot into the details, but Donald Norman, the guy who wrote the initial books that created fundamentally the domain of UX and usability. Um, I just finished his book on emotional design mm -hmm. and um, how there were studies showing that people using the exact same software find it find that it works better when um, it makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, uh, and it's also, uh, so this whole idea about alarms going on and engineers needing to react quickly, but being bothered by the alarms is, is about emotional design. It's about figuring out, okay, so what's the emotional state of our users when that alarm mm -hmm. goes on? So you see what we were talking at the beginning, that domain-driven design is very difficult because you need to have so many skills. There you go. Another skill. Understanding users, understanding people, emotion, emotions, uh, interaction. Um, yeah. Tough. Tough, yeah, that's true. And, and it seems like it's only a way of drawing boxes and... Uh, <laughs> yeah and circles about uh, in context okay a breakthrough uh, the team explores scenarios specifically the weird ones then the awkward edge cases where nobody really knows how the system behaves or even how it should behave once a scenario is when two separate sensor sensor measurements raise alarms at the same time the alarm sounds an engineer turns it off but what happens to the second alarm should the alarm still sound or not? Should turning off one turn off the other? If it didn't turn off, would the engineers think the off switch didn't work and just push it again? <laughs> By working, <laughs> that's funny, yeah. But these are actually, so what I like about this, real world problems, okay? Mm -hmm. 
um, by the way, I have a definition of architecture, which is not really a definition, but something that I teach um, software architects or people who want to become software architects. Architecture is when software meets the real world. Um, and this is why, to me, this is one example of when we really need to think about architecture. <laughs> These are architectural decisions. By working through these scenarios that team figure out, there was a distinction between the alarm sounding and the state of alertness. Now in this new model, when measurements from the sensors exceed certain thresholds or exhibit certain patterns, the system doesn't sound the alarm directly anymore. Instead, it raises an alert condition, which is also logged. It's this alert condition that is associated with the actual problem. The new alert concept is now responsible for sounding the alarm or not. The alarm can still be turned off, but the alert condition remains. Two alert conditions with different causes can coexist without being confused by the single alarm. This model decouples the emergency from the sounding of the alarm. Hmm. Absolutely correct. And again, the, the example is brilliant. Uh, I love it. Um, and you see how, in hindsight, it's obvious. It's always like that, right? When you read about how, how a plane crashed, you say, of course, of course it crashed, but uh, no one had thought before. And um, one thing that I see here is a pattern that I often see, which is um, we tend we tend to have domain concepts in our domain model that are too big. And instead, you need to uh, try more and figure out more decoupling between your domain models. Two things that look connected in the real world are not necessarily connected in the software. But what do you? Why do you want to create so so many classes? <laughs> We are making an economy of classes because... Uh, yeah, there are too many classes. Or services or whatever they are. Because There yeah. are too many services, yes. There are too many <laughs> modules. Let's just put them all together. Yeah. Okay. Um, ah, and once again, they, they state precisely what we've seen. It's one of those aha moments that seem obvious in retrospect. Such distinctions are not easily unearthed. It's what Eric Evans calls a breakthrough. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's look at the next section. There was a missing concept and at the first the team didn't know something was missing. Okay. And the next question, interesting, where did the concept come from? People in the domain experience the problem, but without explicit terminology, they couldn't express the problem to the system designers. So it's us, the designers, who created it. It's an act of creative modeling. The concept is invented. In our oil rig monitoring domain, it was a novel way to perceive reality. Yes. Software doesn't necessarily match the real world. Yes, that's why it's software. <laughs> of course, in English, alert and alarm exist. They are almost synonymous. But in our ubiquitous language, we agreed to make them distinct. We designed our ubiquitous language to fit our purpose and is different from the domain language. After we introduced alert conditions, this is in incredibly interesting. After we introduced alert conditions, the oil rig engineers incorporated it in their language. Mm -hmm. So actually through decoupling these concepts, you end up with a new concept in, in the domain language, not only in the ubiquitous language. Yes. And so you realize now that suddenly the problem has changed because of the design. 
people who are using the software understand now their problem better because of the design because of the act of design uh, this is one of the cycles that's very hidden in uh, in software design you you don't think about this often but um i think this goes back to christopher alexander and uh, the idea of of looking at uh, how uh, you how people live and habitability right mm -hmm. i think you go back to this concept uh, it's weird because we connect christopher alexander maybe with this but Christopher Alexander started the, the idea of patterns, then the Plop community started and pick, picked on this idea and started having uh, patterns around software and object orientation. And now we go back to, to people using software. So I think it's a kind of a round circle that makes a lot of sense. But Christopher Alexander has some books that are kind of big where he doesn't really speak about software and they don't seem to have anything to do with software they have to do with architecture uh, buildings for buildings uh, not not software architecture but there you go i think it makes a lot of sense because you need to look at how people live with the system yeah that's true um yeah, and this is, again, one of the reasons I say that programming is a deeply humanistic activity. Yeah. We don't realize it, maybe. We don't apply it often, but it is. Okay, um, how do we know that this newly invented model is, in fact, better? specifically more fit for purpose we find realistic scenarios and test them against the alert condition model as well as other candidate models in our case with the new model the logs will be more accurate which was the original problem but in addition a deeper model often opens new possibilities the alert conditions model suggests several different measurements can be associated with the same alert alert conditions can be qualified and so on um, very interesting and yeah you can do that uh, so in the end the last section is called design creates new realities which is what we've touched about uh, already in a world-centric view of design only the sensors and the alarms existed in the real world and the old software model reflected that accurately therefore it was an accurate model the new model that includes alerts isn't more accurate than the old one. It doesn't come from the real world, it's not more realistic, and it isn't more domainish, but it is more useful. Sensors and alarms are objective compared to alert conditions. Something is an alert condition because in this environment we believe it should be an alert condition, and that's subjective. The problem works for the domain and is connected to it, but it is not purely a model of the problem domain. It better addresses the problems in the context we envision. The solution clarify the problem. Having only a real-world focus for modeling blinds us to better options and innovations. And it ends by saying uh, another quote from Rebecca's book, which is quite old, but we still haven't learned the things that are there. Our measures of success lies in how clearly we invent a software reality that satisfies our application requirements and not in how closely it resembles the real world. Mm, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the model must be radically about its utility in solving the problem. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, let's draw some conclusions, which are, what do you think are the most important things? Uh, I mean, I think we agree that the article is brilliant and very well written. Um, it details some things about design that are not often discussed. But what would be some things that you know our viewers should live with? I think going very 
practically whenever you model something be aware that it's like i don't know writing an article or a book the first one will be awful be aware that you need multiple feedback cycles of improvement you need to test your assumptions and be very open and quite sure that what you created initially was wrong on multiple levels mm -hmm. so try to test your assumptions try to to go to stress your design to push it in many ways as, as we discussed uh, depends on what you design but try to push it to see where it could fail and even like that this is not a way to absolute success mm -hmm. even like that be aware that the real world will hit you and you will find out that somewhere your process your design process was wrong yeah absolutely very unpopular opinion probably <laughs> well i'm gonna go with something that may be even more <laughs> unpopular at least based on the reactions i get on twitter when i write about that um I think it's time that all programmers realize that they are actually designers and that designer implies a level of empathy that we don't have enough levels in our industry. Um, you need the empathy for the programmer who will come and change the code after you the empathy for the tester who will need to check your application if it works, your, your code and your changes. The empathy for the people who will put this code that you wrote in production and run it. And you also need the empathy to for, uh, and probably most important one, that's why I leave it last, the empathy for the users of this product and think about you know what you would feel if 10 alarms sound at the same time and you are forced to you know figure out a solution quickly or your building blows up you know mm -hmm. right so that's the level of empathy that you you should be able to do and not all the time but at least in those times when you stress, as Adi said, when you think about the limits of your design and when you try to stress it a bit and see where, where it breaks. Um, and this empathy is part of the design disciplines, all the design disciplines, apparently except for software design where we still think that we are doing a lot of technical stuff and we only care about how computers uh, work and not about the people who use them yeah. all right i think that's it for today yeah uh very interesting article uh, thank you rebecca and matthias for writing this uh I I think it was well brilliant. Uh, nothing more to add. Um, and okay, so we have a few interviews with uh, Rebecca in this very channel, and you can see uh, our chats with her and how she what she thought about various things from object oriented or how she got. Um, into this career and how she got into object-oriented design, how she got into the PLOP communities, uh, very interesting stories. We have other members of the PLOP communities, uh, Linda Rising, um, so, and a few others actually that we interviewed on this channel. So watch those videos as well if you want to learn more about how we got patterns and uh, what was the influence of Christopher Alexander. Leave us a comment, share, like, you know, uh, it helps us uh, promote these videos. If you like them, tell other people. 
And until next time, remember to think, design, and work smart.